الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين ثم أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا قيما لينذر بأسا شديدا من لدنه ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا حسنا ما كثين فيه أبدا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أمين يا رب العالمين I've been giving lectures for a very long time in my life and I am used to speaking while people are also talking at the same time. I'm also used to the fact that we Muslims, mashallah, sometimes don't have very good recognition of manners. And the simple manners of, you know, you know people are talking during Jumu'ah khutbah, so people talking during a lecture is not a big deal. But here's an exercise that might help. If you see someone talking, stare at them. If you find someone talking, simply stare at them. Sisters, stare at them like you stare at your husband when he comes home late. You are familiar with that look. Uh, guys, just stare at people funny and you know, like those guys over there, just stare at them. And you'll find things will calm down very, very quickly, especially on the sister's side. I've seen it work a thousand times. It actually works pretty well. Okay. So I've been asked to speak to you in these, I, I don't think I'll take long, I think I'll take maybe 20 minutes and I'll stick to that inshallah ta'ala uh, and share with you what I think are some very important ideas. Alhamdulillah, very recently I've had the opportunity to travel to different parts of the world. I have had the opportunity to go to the Middle East, I've had the opportunity to go to Malaysia, alhamdulillah, to Singapore. I've also got a chance to travel a little bit across Europe. And, uh, you know, Canada doesn't really count, but okay, fine, Canada too. Um, Mexico. And it's, you know, when you travel, your perspective changes. And you realize, you first think that, you know, our problems in America or the problems of young people in America or the Muslim community are so unique. We are so different from everyone else. But as you travel, you realize, yes, there are differences. But as a matter of fact, on many levels, we're actually, as a humanity, suffering from the same things. As a, as a human species, we're actually suffering from the same exact things. And I want to highlight what I think are some of the biggest problems that humanity is facing today from my own perspective. You don't have to agree with me in this. And then I'll share with you what I think is a solution from the Qur'an. And that's the end of my talk. That's all really I want to share with you, inshallah. Now, I personally believe that the biggest problem of our time is actually rooted in one thing, it's greed. The biggest problem of humanity is untapered, unchecked greed and selfishness. This greed has led, for example, in, in economic systems, this greed has led to major corporations that only care about the bottom line, and how will they increase their projections of their income for year to year to year? And whether that involves destroying entire parts of the ocean, or it involves ruining entire villages, or it involves destroying mountains, or you know, ruining not only the physical environment, but even the social or economic environments around the world, it doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, it feeds the bottom line. So a great deal of the corruption in the world, the political corruption, the environmental corruption that is so worrisome, right? At the end of it all, it all boils down to unchecked, unrestricted, uncontrollable greed. That one, that's what it comes down to. So I personally feel that that is actually the root of many, many, many problems in the world today. And if you explore this concept of greed, Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran describes it in a very articulate fashion. He says, وَمَن يُوقَ شُحَّ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ It's very interesting language. Allah says, whoever has been protected from the greed that they have within themselves 
In other words, Allah is acknowledging the fact that all human beings have what? They have greed. We're all greedy. That's not something that some people are greedy and some people are not. We are all in fact greedy. And then Allah says, وَمَنْ يُوْقَى Which is the passive form. What that suggests is, whoever has been given protection from that greed. In other words, there's something inside me and I can't even protect myself from it. يعني لم يقول ومن اتقى شح نفسه Whoever was able to protect themselves from their greed. When I say, listen carefully now, if I say, I am able to protect myself, who's doing the act of protecting? I am. I'm the one protecting who? Myself. But if I say, I am being protected, when I use that kind of language, who's doing the protecting? Someone else. Someone unmentioned. Allah is saying in this ayah, you have to be protected from the outside. There's something from the outside that has to come that will protect you from the greed that lies deep inside of you. And that greed is inseparable from you. Which is why we find in the language of the Quran, not even a shuha fi nafsihi, a shuha li nafsihi. It's actually shuha nafsihi. Which means, it's, for grammar students, that's an ilafa. It's a mudaf and a mudaf ilay. And these two are locked with each other. You can't separate a mudaf from a mudaf ilay. So rhetorically, it is as though saying, Allah is saying, human beings will never be able to separate themselves from greed. There will never come a day where your iman is so high that you're no longer greedy. It will never happen. Every single day, you and I will have to protect ourselves against greed. Every single day. It's going to be a moment-to-moment -moment struggle. I started with major corporations and the, the polluting and the destruction of the earth. But let's bring it closer to home. Every mother is greedy, every father is greedy. Every son, every daughter is greedy. Every child is greedy. A child says, you bought me this toy last week, I need the next one. You bought me, you know, uh, my, my, my son asked me for a foot soldier, the new kind of foot soldier from the Ninja Turtles. Right, because they changed the foot soldiers, they're uglier now. They used to be a lot classier, but now they have like buggy eyes and skinny heads and it's kind of weird looking. But he wants the new one, because he's watching the new kinds of Ninja Turtles. So he says, Abba, get me the foot soldier. So I got him the foot soldier and I, you know, he's really happy when I gave it to him. And then he said to me, I need three more foot soldiers. Because I need one for each turtle. You know, you can't, they can't, four guys fighting one foot soldier. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. That's not gonna... You know, this needs to be somewhat of a fair fight, so... <laughs> Even a three-year-old can have greed. You'll have, you'll bring home a cake, you'll bring home M&M, something, something small, minuscule, candy. And kids will crowd around, and one child will get one piece, and one child gets two pieces. What does the first child immediately say? So is my piece. His piece is yellow, can I have a yellow piece? Wait, that, your M is bigger than my M. Yours is a capital M. Why did I? There was immediate comparison, you know? And so what you find, even as you ask children, you ask them, you know, so if he eats two and you eat one, will yours taste worse? Will yours taste any better? If it, does it take away from your happiness at all? Just knowing that somebody else has something, I want it. And you know what's crazy about greed? You don't feel it until you see someone else. A kid is sitting there, his toy is sitting there, he's not playing with it. His brother walks by. He looks at the toy. And what does the kid do immediately? <laughs> immediately, immediately, you become possessive in the presence of others. And when they're not around, you don't care. You know what we're learning? We're learning a lot of our greed is actually a result of our environment. As a matter of fact, when we're in solitude, sometimes you don't want anything. Sometimes the most, the best thing you'll ever want is just to sit quietly and stare at the sky, or sit at the edge of an ocean and just look out at the water, and you want nothing. You're happy, you're fine, you're content. But when you drive down the street and you see a nice car, when you go to a nice neighborhood, you see a big house, when you travel to another city and you see like a better, better weather than Dallas, which isn't hard to find, Right? Then what happens immediately? Oh, I want that. I want that. This greed doesn't just pollute the earth. It pollutes families. 
You know, it pollutes families. It pollutes communities. And greed isn't just about money. Greed is about wanting more than your share in life. In everything. If you're the vice president, you want to be the president. If you're the assistant teacher, you want to be the principal. If you're the principal, you want to be, a, you know, go beyond that and be the principal of a bigger school. If you're the janitor and there's another guy who's a janitor, you want to be the head janitor. You know? If you're in the MSA and you're the secretary, you want to be the president. Everybody wants to keep moving up. If you're working and you got an entry level job, pretty soon you want to be the manager. You just want to keep doing your own. You want to keep pushing yourself up, 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 up. And you're never satisfied. You'll find people that are some of the most accomplished people in the world also live some of the most miserable lives. People that are making billions of dollars, they're, they're making an insane amount of money. These people actually, most of them, have no life. They have no life. They have no family life. They have no vacation time. They don't like taking a vacation. They want to keep moving up and they feel like when they're taking a vacation, the machine is slowing down. So they have to go back into it. And even if they're sitting on vacation, they're answering emails and they're... You know, they're still at work mentally. They're never, their mind is never taking a break. This is what greed can do to you. Greed can actually give you a miserable life. Just like the earth itself is feeling the misery of greed, every human being is, feel, is feeling its effects, its misery. What is, what is the greed among young people, among youth? Our greed is to be, you know, what, one of the needs of young people. And, and it, all of us were young at one point, that never changes. I don't understand what the trends are today. I don't. I'm, I'm an old guy. I, I don't understand. And you know, our elders, my elders don't even understand me. So how are they supposed to understand the teenagers here? They're not gonna. And 15 years from now, you won't understand the youth that are teenagers at that time. It's not gonna be the case. You're gonna be outdated yourselves. But you know, one thing remains constant. You wanna be up to speed with the latest thing. Whether it's a gadget, whether it's an app, whether it's a kind of clothing, whether it's terminology, you know, whether it's you know, a, a, a social practice, whatever it may be, you just want to be at the cutting edge. If it's new, you want it. If it's new, it must be good. You want to be the first to say, have you heard? Because if they haven't heard, you were the first to introduce it. You were apprised of it before anyone else. You jumped on it immediately, which what that means then is young people are the most volatile people on the planet, and that's always been the case. Young people jump from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another, moment's notice. For young people, something was incredible, it was beautiful, it was cool, it was whatever it was, and then weeks later, the same thing is stupid, retarded, you know, pathetic, not worthy of mention, you know? They'll move on from one trend to another, to another, very, very, very quickly. And as this happens, these trends happen. Of course, you know, the, the easy, easy demonstrations of that are, are, are newer versions of phones, right? Newer versions of phones, which can look pretty much identical to the old version. But people can still tell somehow that you have the, the 4, not the 5. Or you have the 5C and not the 5S. Or you, you, they can just tell. And you feel inferior all of a sudden because you just have, you know, you just have a phone. It doesn't even have the screen. You still have the button thing, you know. This, this thing that's happened to human beings, let me tell you, let me get to my point now. This thing that's happened where we're constantly thinking about acquiring more, feeling like we're worth more, right? It's left us in a perpetual state of, you know, dissatisfaction. We're perpetually dissatisfied. That's one result of it. We're just always miserable. We're always cynical. Everything that comes your way, you make fun of it. You put it down in one way or the other, by, either by way of your humor, or by way of your comments, or with a slight remark like a whatever. That's your attitude towards everything. You become cynical, which you know what that means? You don't know what it means to enjoy life anymore. Because you dismiss everything around you. You just, to you, that's become the way to do things, to dismiss things around you. You can't appreciate anything anymore. What happens with teenagers when you take them on vacation? Why don't you look happy? Well, how's the hotel? You know, amazing views, and yeah, that's okay, you know, whatever. 
can't appreciate it. You can't appreciate it. The, the, that's taken away from you. The other thing that's happened as a result of this overexposure to greed, constant and immediate gratification, you know what's happened? There is an entire generation of young people that are completely and utterly unmotivated. They are constantly drawn to do so much and acquire so much that they've just lost the will to accomplish anything in life. They can just sit at home and play video games all day and watch one episode after another, after another on Netflix or on Amazon or on Hulu or on YouTube or whatever. And they just keep going and you say, what do you want to do? Nothing. What do you want to do tomorrow? A little more or nothing. What, do you, what are your goals in life? I don't have goals. What's your major? I'm not sure. You're, you've been a senior for five years. How are you not sure of your major? I'm not sure. I tried everything. I, you know, whatever. And so you're just, you're just an entire generation of unmotivated people. You know what happens when you have an entire civilization of unmotivated people? That people of greed, the people who do crimes and literally plunder the earth of its riches and manipulate the, you know, the, the weak, they get away with everything because the vast majority of people just don't have the, the sensitivity to care. They've, their greed made them completely desensitized. So long as my needs are met, what do I care? What do I care? So we live in a time now where you can watch, you can flip channels on TV, or you can be shown an ad or a Facebook page or whatever of you know some children that are suffering in Africa, or some flood that happened in Bangladesh, or some earthquake that happened in Pakistan, and you can see those pictures and just nothing happens, nothing in you moves. There's no tear that comes out of your eye, nothing happens. You are emotionally completely disconnected from human suffering, completely. And you know what? That is a really scary thing. Not even, we're not even talking about Iman now, we're talking about we are now becoming less than human. That is a human emotion. You could be a Christian, a Jew, an atheist for all I care. When you see human suffering, something is supposed to happen. There's supposed to be something that disturbs you, that makes you want to help. But when that no longer happens, when you just change the channel back to what you really want to watch, a movie that will you know, drain your brain again, which is what's happening today. That is a scary time. I went to one of the Muslim countries and I asked, as an Arab country, I said, what is the past? What do youth do here? What do young people do here? You know the answer I got from almost 50 people? It's a consistent answer. They like to hang out at the mall. It's a hot Arab country. It's hot all day. They stay indoors. The malls open up at night. From about Maghrib time to Fajr time, the malls are packed. There's your Ummah. There's your future. What kind of fathers will they be? What kind of mothers will they be? What kind of du'a to Islam will they be? What kind of governments will those people run? What, what kind of human beings are they going to be? Forget Muslims. What kind of human beings are they going to be? <laughs> you understand? And so I bring it back a little bit. I scale it back. I, I've gone over, I'm about five minutes short of being over my time. What I want to really talk to you about today is the gift of the Qur'an. I know you've heard many lectures where you're told we have to learn the Qur'an, we have to understand what it means, we have to study it, we have to recite it, Muslims have to connect with the Qur'an. I, you've heard all of this before a thousand times. I hope I can add just one new dimension to that conversation, just one. I'd like you to understand, from my own personal experience, I'm sharing something with you. There have been philosophical problems, there have been moral dilemmas, there have been emotional problems that I've had in my life, right? Everyone has emotional challenges at one point or another, everyone has a philosophical crisis at one point or another, an intellectual crisis at one point or another, a financial difficulty at one point or another. The greatest gift my, my, my teacher gave me, he said, when you have trouble, turn to Allah's book. Turn to Allah's book. And my motivation for learning Arabic, my motivation for studying tafsir was not so I can gain knowledge of the Qur'an. It was, my knowledge was not my intention. And it's still not my intention. I am not concerned with knowledge. I am concerned with accessing a resource that will, that will heal me. It's like I see the Qur'an as a well, and I get thirsty every so often. And I go back and I take, and I get healed. I get, it, it, it relieves me, you know? We have to understand the Qur'an as shifa. Qur'an is shifa. It is healing. A 
lot of people think, well, I read the translation of the Qur'an, I understand some of it, I'm studying some of it, I'm learning a little bit of Arabic. Yeah, but that learning, and I'm a big advocate of learning, learning is not the goal. Learning is not the goal. Learning is simply learning to draw water from that well so you can take it. It's like saying I learned everything about healthy nutrition, but you don't eat healthy food. What's the point of learning it? I learned everything about proper dietary practices, good exercise. I know what exercises you should do, when you should do them, what's the best time to do them. But you don't do any of them. I know everything about cars. I know when you should change the oil, how to fix a broken transmission. But you don't take care of your car. What are you doing? Why are you learning this? Why are you learning it? It's supposed to be something that helps you, right? I'm arguing that for the most part, we keep pushing this idea that you should learn, you should learn, you should learn, but we're not pushing the idea that you should take. Taking is different from learning, you see? And Muslims can learn a lot about the Qur'an and be as miserable and as materialistic and as greedy as the non-Muslim, except they're really knowledgeable. <laughs> There's no difference. Allah Azza wa gave us this book because human beings deviate. And when human beings deviate, this book sets them straight again. And guess what? Soon later, soon after, they deviate again. And this book sets them straight again. And then they deviate again. And it sets them straight again. إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَمْ This Qur'an guides to what is straighter. What is straighter. Meaning you go this way and it straightens you up again. Then you tilt over, it straightens you up again. وَيُبَشِّرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ الَّذِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ الصَّالِحَاتِ then it congratulates believers who can accomplish some good deeds. Allah is acknowledging the fact that you and I will make mistakes, that you and I will have downs. There will be moments of th that we're down. But Allah is promising us if you develop a real relationship with this book, I am guaranteeing you, if your intention to learn this book, your intention to learn this book is to benefit from its healing, you will, you, Allah will open the doors of learning like you couldn't have imagined. Arabic will become piece of cake for you. Nothing is nothing. Studying tafsir will become super easy for you. Why? Not because you're seeking the knowledge, because you need the healing from Allah's word. You want the, the word of Allah to be able to en enter inside your heart. You know, this counsel has come to you. This healing has come to you. You know, a, a, cure, a cure has come to you. SubhanAllah. This is really the message I have for you today. Some of you will listen to this as just another speech. Just another, you just say a takbir at the end and some people clap and it's over. But I'm hoping some of you take this to heart. I can't help you build a relationship with the Qur'an. The only one who can help you do that is Allah. If you can turn to Allah and say, Ya Rabb, I need this healing, I need this book. This book that you sent so it can cure the problems of humanity. By the way, where does greed rest? Where does greed live? Inside the heart. So all of the problems of the world, we can never end them, we can never kill greed, because it's a part of our heart. But you know what? We can heal it, we can control it. We can, Allah, Allah said, remember in the beginning I said, you are to be provided protection from the outside. Guess what that protection is? That's the word of Allah. When the, when the word of Allah starts going inside the heart, it starts getting stronger. You're able to curb your urges. You're able to control your addiction. How many young people, it's a tragedy, addicted to pornography. It's a reality. How many young people I've spoken to who even tell me it's normal. What do you want me to do? Everybody does that. It's not even a bad thing. They've even accepted that the heart is so dead that they can say it's normal. That's an indication that the heart is dead. You know, how is the word of Allah going to enter that heart? I mean, think about that. These eyes, these eyes that Allah gave you as a gift, when you violate them with those images, how are these eyes going to shed tears for Allah? How are they going to do that? You're going to use the same eyes? The same tongue Allah gave you so you can recite His word. You spend all day cussing with it. Foul-mouthing people. You know? These same hands you raise before Allah and you put around so you can stand in front of Allah. These same hands you use to make gestures of vulgarity. To do, re to do wrong. The same hands. How will we become conscious of what we are? Allah says, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهَ فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ don't become like people, the people who forgot about Allah. 
And when they forgot about Allah, Allah made them forget who they are. They forgot their own selves. You don't even know what you are. You're an honored creature of Allah. But because of this greed, you've just turned into something worse than an animal. Please, save yourself. Save yourself. I can't, I have to try to save myself. You have to try to save yourself. And wallahi, the images and the marketing and the, the entire machinery that is there to keep us at the animal level is so powerful. There's so much money being spent on projecting sexual images onto children. So much money is being spent in this direction. There's so much money being spent to, into normalizing deviant, deviant behavior and celebrating it and redefining what it means to be moral, redefining right and wrong. And people are swept up in all of this and they are saying, well, the Quran says this, but you know, I don't feel that's right because their, their moral compass is so crooked now when they see the straight, when you're lying down this way, the straight looks crooked. <laughs> We've gone so crooked, the word of Allah seems like, I don't know if it fits with my moral, with my moral compass. Your moral, you don't have a compass anymore, that's the problem. This was the compass, this is the thing that doesn't change. And I can give you proof, Allah Azza wa gives it Himself. Every single moral principle that is coming out now. Every single idea that people are celebrating. One new idea after another, after another. Ten years ago it was wrong, now it's okay. Ten years later something else will be okay. Ten years later something else will be okay. These moral lines keep shifting and moving. Every ten years, it's a different world. From the world of ethics. But the word of Allah gave us right and wrong. And He gave it at the time of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And to this day it is standing. وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجًا He didn't allow it the possibility to deviate. We deviate. We go from one trend to another. One philosophy to another. One standard to another. One definition of right and wrong to another. And if you can hold on to this book, the storm will come, but you will stand your ground. You will be able to stand your ground. And if not, you can be Muslim, Christian, Jewish, Hindu, Atheist, Sikh, it doesn't matter. You will be swept this way or the other. The, the, on the shell, you'll look like a Muslim or somebody else. But on the inside, it's the same greedy, sorry excuse for a human being. This Islam came to transform us on the inside, not just to change our appearance on the outside. The real transformation of this religion is on the inside. The world will look like, look like a different place when transformations happen on the inside. That, that is really the message I want to share with you. That change will happen if you, with the right attitude, come to Allah's book. If I come to Allah's book with the right attitude, something will change inside us. Something will change inside us. And I tell you, when that happens, and this is the last thing I want to share with you, I promise. When that happens, when there's light of, light of Allah's book, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَالنُّورِ الَّذِي أَنزَلْنَا When the light of Allah's book enters into your heart, then Allah compares your heart to a lamp. And a lamp is lit, but a lamp also gives light. Isn't that true? A lamp is not only lit on its own, but it also becomes a source of light for its surroundings. And a lamp is only beneficial in day or night time. Tell me, night time. In other words, you will become people that are living in an age of darkness, in an era of darkness. Not only will you be lit, you will become a source of light for others. Because what is overwhelmingly surrounding us is darkness. We're, we're at night. This is the night of human civilization. Technology has increased. You know, infrastructure has increased. Human knowledge has increased. But guidance, and, and, and along with this, greed has also increased. Unrestricted greed has also increased. So spirituality has decreased. Decency has decreased. Morality has decreased. SubhanAllah. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal uses you people and your children to raise a generation that represents the light of the Qur'an. That is able to become a beacon of light, not just for your own family, but for your neighborhood, for your community, for the people around you. And wallahi, this will not happen until we give Allah's book its due. So long as we keep pretending that the little bit, little bit of time we give to the Qur'an is enough. And everything else we can give time and this book doesn't get our time. And we don't come to it for really to transform ourselves. We just come to it for interesting information or beautiful recitation. And that's all it is to us. So long as we keep that up, the world will keep heading down in a downward spiral.
and Allah will replace us with somebody else. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِ الْأَخْفَالُهَا Same surah in which Allah says, إِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ Allah says, why don't they reflect on the Qur'an? What's the matter? Are their hearts locked up? Are their hearts not working? Why aren't they thinking so deeply about the Qur'an? By the way, reflecting, thinking deeply, is that something you can do in a split second or does that take time? Thinking deeply. It takes time. When Allah is saying, why aren't they spending time thinking about the Qur'an? What Allah is saying, why aren't they doing that? Oh, it must be the case that their hearts are locked up. And guess what they're locked up with? Greed. And then in the same surah at the end, Surah Muhammad, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَإِن إِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِ الْقَوْ مَنْ غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ If you people turn away, Allah will replace you with somebody else. Unlike you. And they won't, they won't be anything like you losers. Literally. You want to play around with this book, not give it its due? It's not hard for Allah to replace the entire ummah with a better ummah. He's done it before. It's not new for him. I pray, I, I know I'm supposed to be like the humorous guy and supposed to kind of crack a joke here and there and stuff, but sometimes it's just stuff on my mind. I got to let, let it out. It was one of the nights. Sorry. But you know, enough with the entertainment, guys. Let's get serious a little bit. We're entertained enough, don't you think? There's enough entertainment in life. Who's there to get serious? Some, it's, it's, I, I believe in humor, I really do. I, don't, I, th I think for too long Islam has been presented as an angry message. I don't like it. But there are some things in Islam you should get a little mad about. That's a normal, normal expression, it's a normal emotion. I'm not always angry, actually I'm usually not angry. That's my normal state of being, I think. At least I like to think. Ask my wife. But you know what, for some things, we gotta, we gotta take a step back and kind of really see what we're doing. Really, really see what we're doing. I, I, I want to, first of all, before I let you go, I want to have you guys give a serious round of applause and a shout out to all the young people that put this thing together. <laughs> Seriously. This is... I have... I have had an extremely long day. I'm already half asleep. I'm not even sure what I'm saying at this point. The switch was turned off sometime during Isha. Uh, but I came here simply because young people are putting in effort. Young people are putting in, I'm so proud of them. I'm really, I, don't, I haven't met all of the volunteers, but whoever you are, I salute you. I am so proud of you that you're putting this effort and your parents should be proud of you. Your parents should not be yelling at you if your parents are here. Your parents should be proud of you. They should be giving you a hug and saying, good job. You do more of these things. I wish you spent more time with these other good Muslim people. You know, you have enough lousy friends. Mashallah, you made some good friends here. And those of you that didn't, volunteer, volunteer next time. Volunteer. There should be like, this a whole hall should be empty. Everybody volunteering outside. You know, that's how it should be. But uh, guys, get yourselves busy with productive things. So you learn to think about more than yourselves. These young people, they could have been staying at home watching a movie. It's so easy, man. It's even on their phone. They could, they could have been doing nothing. They could have gone to a movie theater. They could have gone to the hookup place down the street. I know all of them. You know, they could have done any, but they volunteered. They volunteered, probably got yelled, by, yelled at by an uncle or two. You know, they got, probably got dirty looks. They, you know, all of that happened, they still volunteered. Man, I, I, I respect that. I'm proud of it. Let's keep that up. You know, let's keep that momentum going. Mashallah, great job putting this together. And if, you know, I, it's very hard to book me. I'll be honest with you. It's very, very hard for me to come to do a speaking event. Usually when I come, I don't come back for a long time. But you guys, the youth here, you put an event together, I'll show up. I'm promising you that. You, you do, I, 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 live in, I live in this city, this is our city, this is a place that we have to improve, and if the young people here are putting an effort, then whether they're putting this effort, but you have to work with each other. Not our masjid, not their masjid, no, 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 everybody together. You do a collaborative program, I don't care if you do it in Irving, or you do it in Epic, and you do, even if you do it in Arlington, I'll even go to Arlington. God, you know how serious that commitment is? I'm willing to go to Arlington. That's like leaving civilization. But I'll still go. If you guys do it, I'll still go. Because I want you guys to, to build this momentum. I want you to build this. And you, the rest of you, you have to support this. And I said, well, it's not an arm masjid, so we're not going. No, support their efforts. 
Show up in bigger numbers. Show up with your extended family. You know, do that because we, you know, they need encouragement. They really they need encouragement. I moved to this city because I thought it's a great place for family and little kids. You know what I didn't notice in this city when I moved here? I noticed there is no youth activity. Young people, teenagers, they have no activity. College students, I see almost no activity. I want to see that change. I want to make this, uh, this city should be the most active youth city. It's already leading the country in so many things, but the youth not yet. The youth not yet. Come on, let's pick it up, guys. Let's show, let's show the rest of the country, if not the rest of the world, what it's like, what Muslim youth can do in a city. Let's do that, inshallah ta'ala. Thank you so very much for listening. Jazakumullah khairan.